A special note for long-time viewers of this series. This is not, strictly speaking, an episode about Planet X, although Planet X does figure into it somewhat. What it is, I hope, is a crash course on every major development in solar system studies over the last 40-odd years, which you will need if you're going to make head or tail of this story's final chapter. Speaking of, I know I said in my 500 subs video that the Planet X series had two more episodes to go, but I realized about halfway through writing this that there was no way on God's green earth or any other planet that I was going to tell this story in one video. So I split it in half. It'll be a longer slog, but hopefully if you stick around for both parts, you'll have a pretty good idea of why Pluto isn't a planet anymore. Strap in. This is going to get contentious. In 1920, a young astronomer at the Hamburg Observatory made a particularly puzzling discovery. Walter Bade was only 27, but he'd already established a name for himself as a star hunter and object seeker. Within two years, he would have a comet to his name. Within a decade, he would coin the word supernova. And within 20 years, he would have confirmed one of the most profound facts about the universe's evolution, that the heavy elements needed to form planets, comets, and ourselves were forged in the death throes of ancient stars. But for this story, all that needs to be known is that on Halloween 1920, Bada noted a small asteroid through his telescope of a type no one had ever seen before. While its perihelion, or closest distance to the sun, of 1.9 AU, was slightly interior to the asteroid belt, its aphelion, or farthest distance from the sun, was a ridiculous 9.5 AU, or the orbit of Saturn. What was an asteroid doing out in the region where only comets had been found before? While perplexing, Bada's object never gained much attention, and in 1923 it was officially lumped with the other asteroids under the name 944 Hidalgo. Hidalgo failed to excite much interest, mainly because it was a fluke. By the following year, 1,000 asteroids would be identified, of which only Hidalgo showed such orbital peculiarities. With odds of a thousand to one, there is little need for an underlying theory beyond, well, stuff happens. Of course, if Hidalgo were not alone, that might suggest our solar system was due for an overhaul, but it would be nearly 60 years before a similar oddity was stirred up in the solar system saucepan, an oddity that would owe its discovery entirely to Planet X. Like Clyde Tombaugh's, Charles Kowal's astronomical career was a tale of scientific grind interspersed with flashes of immortalizing discovery. His primary job, which he pursued for 20 years, largely at the Palomar Observatory's Schmidt Telescope in California, which we will soon be seeing more of, was searching photographic plates for supernovae. But Brian Marsden, for decades head of the International Astronomical Union, or IAU's, Minor Planet Center, suggested that, since he was there, he might as well use the time to track down lost asteroids and reconfirm their orbits. Kowal took up the challenge, and in the process discovered two moons of Jupiter, Leda and Themisto, though the latter was subsequently lost and only recovered in the year 2000. In 1977, Kowal decided to search for Planet X. He had no particular reason why. Charon's discovery and its subsequent rendering of Pluto as the X-Planet X was still a year in the future. He just thought, why not? No one had conducted a serious search of the outer solar system since Tomba, and now telescopes could see much farther than Tomba's limit of 17th magnitude. Who knew what might be out there? Kowal even secretly entertained a possible name for his object, Radamanthus, after the Greek judge of the dead. He decided that, like Tomba, he would search the entire zodiac, and estimated that it would take him ten years. In fact, his search's only historic find was made before the year ended. On the 1st of November, 1977, Kowal was eyeing plates he'd taken a few weeks before when he noticed a moving object. Brightness measurements suggested it could not be more than 140 kilometers across, so it certainly wasn't Planet X, but thanks to recovery images from as far back as 1895, Kowal was able to determine that it was nonetheless something special. Kowal had caught his object at perihelion, which at 8.4 AU was just inside the orbit of Saturn, but its aphelion was 19 AU, or about the orbit of Uranus. This made it the most distant minor planet ever observed. 
too small to be a planet, too far out to be an asteroid, and too inactive to be a comet, Object Koal, as it was known, defied any easy classification. In 1979, much as had happened to Hidalgo decades earlier, the IAU finally admitted defeat and declared it an asteroid under the name 2060 Chiron. The name Chiron, the divine centaur who tutored the ancient Greek heroes in astronomy and healing, was a personal choice by Kowal, who had been reading John Updike's novel The Centaur at the time. However, it would prove to be a more fitting name than he could ever have realized. In keeping with the Planet X fever of the time, Chiron was immediately hailed by the press as a tenth planet. It was, of course, nothing of the sort, but that didn't stop it becoming popular with astrologers, who employ it in their charts to this day. If Chiron wasn't a planet, or a comet, or an asteroid, what was it? One person who thought he knew was Brian Marsden, and, armed with Chiron and its older brother Hidalgo, he felt he finally had the ammunition he needed to take on one of his oldest foes. For his opening volley, he decided he would poop a very particular party. Perhaps the greatest single beneficiary of Pluto's de-planet exification was Clyde Tombaugh. With Lowell's supposed prediction of Pluto, now revealed as the lucky guess of a desperate kook, Tombaugh could claim sole eternal credit for his planet's discovery. Additionally, the discovery of Pluto's moon Charon had brought the ninth planet back into the public consciousness after decades in the shadow of the space race and its various discoveries. During the 50s and 60s, Pluto had been largely forgotten, but the 1980s saw Tombaugh's fan mail soar. The realization of just how tiny Pluto really was made it an instant hit with children who identified with the lonely little planet out in the cold. In just a few years, Pluto had gone from being a dark and mysterious planet X to being... cute. The fact that no one knew exactly what it looked like meant that it was possible to draw it as anything you wanted, and many decided to draw it smiling. Bathed in this surge of admiration, Tombaugh likely saw little danger in inviting Marsden to give a talk on the golden anniversary of his object's discovery in February 1980 at his self-built base, the New Mexico State University Astronomy Department. He would learn too late that he had let a snake into his nest. Over the coming decades, many would declare themselves proud opponents of Pluto's planethood, but no single individual could claim to have more doggedly sought Pluto's defenestration than Brian Marsden. The origin of Marsden's peculiar loathing for planet Pluto has never been entirely clear. Perhaps it was simply that, as head of the IAU's Minor Planet Center, it was his job to properly catalog and file away all of the small objects in the solar system, and Pluto, with its odd orbit and tiny size, was looking more and more like a misfiled asteroid than a proper planet. Marsden's was a numerical mind. At the age of ten, he had worked out Kepler's third law by himself. He wasn't about to let petty sentiment get in the way of good accounting. Marsden sadly passed away in 2010, so I never got a chance to ask him, but I think I can state with reasonable certainty that at no point in his entire life did anyone once describe him as tactful. His lecture began simply enough, covering the discovery of the planets in the solar system from Herschel to the present, and then took a sudden turn. He noted Pluto's tiny size and that it crossed the orbit of Neptune, as no other planet did. But with the discovery of Chiron, together with the peculiar asteroid Hidalgo, we now possessed a representative sample of the solar system objects which crossed the orbits of the outer planets. Quote, Is it therefore perhaps not time we dropped the Appalachian Ninth Planet? He asked his stunned audience, and classified Pluto with the two objects it most obviously resembles, as an unusual minor planet. He even offered to grant Pluto a nice round minor planet number, 330, vacated by a previous object now known not to exist. The speech did not go down well. As Alan Boyle noted in his book The Case for Pluto, it was, quote, as if someone had stood up at a couple's golden anniversary party and announced that the wedding was a sham. My dad was angry, said Tombaugh's daughter Annette, and he was crushed that Brian chose that time to bring it up. For his part, Morrison apparently failed to grasp the entirety of his faux pas, arguing that, quote, it was partly in jest that I spoke at the time, and that they're not astronomers, they just don't see it in the right way. Much of Marsden's ire focused on Percival Lowell himself, whom he described as, quote, very much in the minor leagues, which, to be fair, is arguably true. But Marsden went further than most in his criticism of Lowell and of his observatory, saying that they had bamboozled the public in their desperate wish to have found Planet X, 
particularly in their failure to provide more than one position for Pluto, thus preventing others from seeing its strange orbit. This whole thing of calling it a major planet should not have been done, he said in the early 90s. If I had been in charge, then it would not have been done. In the coming years, Marston would see his preconceptions both utterly confounded and validated in ways he could never have expected. First, in 1988, Chiron underwent a sudden surge of brightness, revealing itself to be a distant comet. Today, Chiron carries both the asteroid designation 2060 and the comet designation 95P, making it a truly composite being, worthy of the name of a centaur. And then, in 1992, David Rabinowitz, a minor planet hunter at Yale, discovered an object in an orbit similar to Chiron's, which he named Pholus, after another centaur. Today, dozens of objects are known to circle in Chiron-like orbits between the outer planets, all of which are collectively called the centaurs. By the late 80s, it was becoming increasingly clear that Pluto, Charon, and the centaurs were only fragments of a much larger whole. It was as if we were sailing toward some fog-shrouded, undiscovered island, with only the tips of the highest peaks visible. Centaurs had dynamical lifetimes of only a few million years. Sooner or later, they would either fall into the inner solar system, becoming short-period comets, or be expelled by the outer planets into interstellar space. So how could there be so many of them at any one time? Rain does not fall from a clear blue sky. Somewhere, there had to be a cloud. And there was. At least, astronomers universally believed so. In 1950, Dutch astronomer Jan Oort proposed that long-period comets, those like Hale-Bopp, with orbits lasting thousands of years, had a common place of origin, a giant spherical shell of comets 50 to 100,000 AU beyond the known solar system. The so-called Oort cloud is universally accepted as being the reservoir for the long-period comets. Those comets with shorter orbits, such as Comet Halley or Comet Enka, were simply Oort cloud comets that had been captured by the outer planets and sent into the inner solar system. Except there was a problem. The short-period comets are rather sharply divided into two very different groups. Halley-type comets, which have orbits of up to 200 years and inclinations of up to 90 degrees, and Jupiter-family comets, which all had orbits of less than 20 years and inclinations of less than 20 degrees. In addition, many Halley-type comets, including Halley itself, had retrograde orbits. They orbit in the opposite direction to the planets, while Jupiter-family comets all possess perfectly normal planetary orbits. While capture from the Oort cloud could explain the Halley-type comets, explaining the Jupiter-family comets was a different matter altogether. In 1980, an Uruguayan astronomer named Julio Angel Fernandez proposed a radical solution. He observed that the Jupiter comets have mean lifespans of just 1,400 years, meaning that to maintain their current numbers, they would need to be replenished at a rate of about one every 20 years. Conversely, estimates of rates of comet capture by the outer planets were in the range of one every few centuries, far too few to account for the swarm observed. If, on the other hand, one inserted a comet belt between 35 and 50 AU, i.e. roughly containing the orbit of Pluto, then the existence of the Jupiter family comets was explained. For whatever reason, Fernandez's paper went largely ignored until, in 1985, it was reviewed by a young Canadian astronomer named Scott Tremaine. He and his colleagues at the University of Toronto, intrigued by Fernandez's proposal, sought to model it using a computer. Unfortunately, it wasn't until 1988 that computers attained the necessary power to perform the vast numbers of calculations required. When the simulations were finally run, a comet belt matched predictions so closely that its existence seemed incontrovertible. To bolster his claims of a comet belt, Fernandez had cited the work of previous giants in his field, such as Gerard Kuiper or Fred Whipple, though neither had suggested precisely what he had proposed. Regardless, having seen them cited in Fernandez's paper, Tremaine named this undiscovered region the Kuiper Belt. Now all that was needed was to find it. Enter David Jewett. David Jewett is a British astronomer living in California, known for his caustic, acerbic wit, a wit I can attest to, having been on the receiving end of it in email exchanges. Unlike most astronomers, who tend to focus on very big things, David Jewett has devoted his career to exceptionally small things. In 1979, he discovered Jupiter's moon Adrastea in the photos of Voyager 1. In 1982, he became the first person in 72 years to observe Halley's Comet. In the 2000s, he, as well as Julio Fernandez, led a surge of discoveries of tiny moons of Jupiter and Saturn, including Themisto, the lost moon originally found by Charles Cowell. Due to his focus on the very small, 
Jewett tended to see the solar system not as a pristine piece of celestial clockwork, but as a cosmic scrapyard swarming with junk. The odd thing was, the further you got from Earth, the less junk there appeared to be, until you crossed the orbit of Neptune and found, well, nothing. Yes, there was Pluto, but where was the junk? The centaurs had finally shown that the region between Jupiter and Neptune was just as much of a junkyard as everywhere else in the solar system. But it all petered out once you crossed Neptune's orbit. From Jewett's perspective, that seemed flatly wrong. Nothing entitled Pluto to such spotless accommodations. In 1986, David Jewett set out to permanently lower Pluto's property value. To begin his search, Jewett employed the 24-inch Burl Schmidt telescope at Kitt Peak. Like Clyde Tombaugh, Jewett armed himself with a blink comparator and a pile of photographic plates, and focused his search on the opposition point. Unlike Clyde Tombaugh, Jewett wasn't interested in hunting the entire zodiac. If his sought-after junk existed, it would exist in large enough quantities to be noticeable anywhere he looked. So he restricted his search area to the spring and autumn equinoxes, because their opposition points were furthest from the Milky Way, and thus had the fewest stars. After a year, he realized he was getting nowhere, and for help he turned to a young graduate student named Jane Lu. Lu's parents were South Vietnamese, who had worked with the Americans as translators during the war, and had been evacuated with her from the fall of Saigon. Arriving in the U.S. as a refugee, she eventually settled in California, where she sailed through high school and gained a bachelor's from Stanford. Her collaboration with Jewett would eventually last five years, and encompass her entire graduate education, both at UC Berkeley and at MIT. For all the continuous effort they put in, the bulk of the project, it turned out, was simply waiting for technology to improve. Lou and Jewett were of a less hardy generation than Clyde Tombaugh, and found using the blink comparator physically painful. So, even though it meant decreasing their field of view by an initially massive amount, they turned to charged couple devices, or CCDs, essentially primitive digital cameras, which were not only far more sensitive, but sped up the process and lessened the pain. As the years wore on, Lou and Jewett took comfort in Moore's Law. Every new generation of digital camera would be twice as powerful as the previous, and with each jump in technology would come a doubling of their field of view. Eventually, Jewett and Lou moved their search to the massive observatory complex atop Mauna Kea, the towering dormant shield volcano that rises 4,200 meters from the Pacific Ocean to provide near-perfect viewing conditions. In the summer of 1992, the University of Hawaii installed a 4 million pixel camera on their 2.2 meter Mauna Kea telescope. Bingo! After five years of searching, Jewett and Lou found their first piece of trans-Neptunian junk within a matter of weeks. Marsden made a $500 bet with Jewett that what he had found was a centaur. He lost, but got a fancy lunch in return. 1992 QB1 was not, and indeed is not, a particularly fascinating or imposing object. Essentially a lump of dirty ice about the size of Fiji, it would not be nearly as enticing a travel destination. It doesn't even have a proper name. Lou and Jewett had suggested Smiley as a possibility, but that name, believe it or not, was already taken. Nevertheless, it changed everything. With sheer perseverance, Jewett and Lou had shown that the preconceptions of their fellow astronomers about the solar system were wrong. QB1 would open a vast new region to explore, and solar system astronomy, long seen as the discipline's ancient frumpy grandma, would become cool again. During his search, Jewett had heard from his MIT colleague Scott Tremaine about his belief in what he called the Kuiper Belt. In his paper announcing QB1's discovery, Jewett declared it a, quote, candidate Kuiper Belt object. Today, the Kuiper Belt is home to over a thousand confirmed objects, with tens of thousands still awaiting discovery. Imagine if you were in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, constantly wondering about all the strange noises you could hear, only to wake up one day and realize that you were in the center of a city. That is the effect that the discovery of the Kuiper Belt had on our understanding of the solar system. Taken as a whole, the Kuiper Belt occupied a region of space more than twice the size of the old solar system, and extended its boundaries out to nearly a hundred times Earth's distance from the Sun. Many facts about the solar system that had once seemed mysterious now appeared self-explanatory. Neptune's oddly orbiting moon Triton? A captured Kuiper Belt object. Pluto's anomalously large moon Charon? The result of an impact with another Kuiper Belt object. The centaurs? A rain of Kuiper Belt objects thrown inward by Neptune. But of all the mysteries the Kuiper Belt solved, the greatest, by far, was Pluto. As the ninth planet, Pluto had never made sense. As the largest member of the Kuiper Belt, however, Pluto, seemingly, at long last, had found its place. 
Planets do not have wildly extended orbits, but Kuiper Belt objects do. Planets do not veer off the ecliptic like drunk drivers, but Kuiper Belt objects do. The KBOs shared Pluto's icy composition, and the main body of the belt is encompassed by Pluto's orbit. Pluto even has its own club of KBOs, the Plutinos, that share its peculiar, high-inclination, Neptune-dodging orbit. Whatever else one chose to call Pluto, it was undoubtedly a Kuiper Belt object. But could it not also be a planet? One advantage Pluto had, for the time being at any rate, was size. As of the turn of the millennium, Pluto was five times larger than the largest KBO discovered, and as long as it could reign unquestioned over its backyard empire, most scientists felt comfortable granting it a dual citizenship in both the Kuiper Belt and Planet Clubs. There was, after all, no formal definition for the word planet, and Pluto had too much historical baggage for its status to be revoked. One person who definitely felt this way was, naturally, Clyde Tombaugh, who in the waning years of his life raised his baton to defend the honor of his planet. In a 1994 letter to the magazine Sky and Telescope, he wrote, While we're considering reclassifying astronomy, how about revamping the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram so that the spectral types are all alphabetically ordered? No, that would wreck extensive catalogs of stellar spectra. Or let's throw out the awkward constellation system. Alas, that would discard our beautiful mythology. Pluto started out as the ninth planet, a supposed fulfillment of Lowell's Planet X. Let's simply retain Pluto as the ninth major planet. After all, there is no Planet X. For 14 years, I combed two-thirds of the entire sky down to 17th magnitude, and no more planets showed up. I did the job thoroughly and correctly. Pluto was your last chance at a major planet. While I am not one to begrudge Dr. Tombaugh a little self-congratulation, that last sentence would turn out to be wrong. Though, sadly, Tombaugh wouldn't live to learn why. On the 17th of January, 1997, just three weeks short of his 91st birthday, Clyde Tombaugh died of congestive heart failure at his adopted home of Las Cruces, New Mexico. The controversy over his planet, according to his daughter Annette, quote, didn't help his condition any. I will grant Brian Marsden this. He had enough tact to wait until Clyde was a year in the ground before relaunching his campaign to kill his planet. And yes, he did use that word. In 1998, he declared that, quote, Pluto has been a long-standing myth that's difficult to kill. As far as Marsden was concerned, the case for Pluto's planethood was already dead. Why should people weep for Pluto when no one shed a tear for one-time planets Ceres, Pallas, Juno, or Vesta, all now exiled, and rightly in Marsden's opinion, to the category of asteroids? Pluto was a Kuiper Belt object, as anyone with any knowledge of the subject agreed. Should it not then be classified with its fellows, as those planets had been? In 1999, Marsden made what was for him a modest proposal to his superiors at the IAU. Minor planet number 10,000 was approaching fast. Grant that auspicious number to Pluto. Or alternatively, create a separate list for the Kuiper Belt object and make Pluto number one. He was even willing to let Pluto retain its planetary status for the time being. It says something about Marsden that he presumably believed his plan had a chance of success. All it took was for Mark Sykes, Pluto cheerleader, occasional operatic baritone, and director of the Planetary Science Institute at Tucson to leak news of his plan to the public for it to drown in a black tide of bile. Send those scientists to Pluto, cried the Peoria Journal Star, the paper of record in Tombaugh's first state of Illinois. The IAU wasn't about to make a change without consensus, and Marsden's idea was quickly quashed. Maybe I've been too democratic about it, Marsden pondered later. Maybe I should have just made the decision and that's that. Marston's passing thought draws attention to one crucial fact. As a member of the IAU, he did technically have the authority to dethrone Pluto if he so chose, since the IAU is the body responsible for naming and classifying astronomical discoveries. Of course, the fact that he didn't do it is a reminder that the IAU works by public vote, and wouldn't have taken kindly to him going rogue. Not a body accustomed to controversy, their most vociferous discussions involve which precise moment to add the next leap second, they were content to let things rest until such time as facts on the ground compelled them to act. That time would come far sooner than they suspected, or perhaps wanted, and the fact that would ultimately compel them was a young astronomer from Caltech named Michael E. Brown, and we shall be meeting him in the next episode.